Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 20th um, Target 2035 webinar in our series. Um, if you, uh, they're, they're all recorded, and so you can uh, access them online. And it's a pleasure today to introduce today's host, uh, Adam Nelson. And uh, Adam is uh, head of the high throughput discovery at the Rosalind Franklin Institute in the UK. And he's a professor of chemical biology at the University of Leeds and deputy director of the Asbury Center for Structural Molecular Biology. And his research interests are in synthetic organic chemistry and in synthetic organic chemistry and its application to biological problems. In particular, he focuses on development of new methods and strategies for discovering biologically active small molecules his goal is to realize autonomous activity-directed discovery of chemical probes. And it's a pleasure to have his expertise and guidance here today. So Adam, I will turn the floor over to you. So thanks ever so much, Cheryl, for the, the kind introduction. Hopefully everyone can, can see my, my slides. So of course, the discovery of bioactive small molecules is an enduring challenge in both chemical biology and in medicinal chemistry. And today we're gonna to be looking at some of the, the challenges and solutions, I guess, to realizing um, fully autonomous uh, molecular um, discovery. So on this slide, I've highlighted some of the hallmarks of current molecular discovery practice. And I guess that this design synthesis purify test cycle here is familiar to, to many of us. So typically what we do is to design um, a set of molecules, um, typically around a specific molecular design hypothesis. And then we make those compounds um, by making a series of compounds, um, typically um, in, in array format. Those compounds are then individually purified and then biologically evaluated and the results then feed into another cycle of molecular design. So although automation is widely used, particularly in, um, uh, in industry, it tends to be um, done within the individual stages of the discovery cycle and overall integration of automation, um, so-called closed loop discovery, is relatively rare. Fortunately, most of the stages can be performed in parallel with the obvious exception of purification, which is almost always done in series. Um, medicinal chemists tend to rely very heavily on a very narrow toolkit of around um, 10 to 20 or so robust reactions. And this limits the type of chemical space that we're able to um, explore. Final compounds are typically prepared on a multi milligram scale, really driven by the need to characterize those molecules. Um, that's a couple of order, orders of magnitude more than is needed for biological um, evaluation. And typically our design hypotheses um, are tested one by one. So we make a series of compounds one at a time in order to, to test a particular um, design um, idea. So what are the challenges then for um, autonomous um, molecular um, discovery? I'm going to put up a series of challenges around the outside of this diagram here, and I'd say that each of the blue boxes that you're going to see is a pretty significant challenge um, to be um, um, addressed. So in molecular design, we need to be much better at being able to predict molecular function. So that's not just affinity for our intended target, it's also um, being able to predict off-target effects, solubility, uh, metabolic stability, for example. Typically, we design compounds at the moment with a particular chemistry in mind, so maybe a series of amides or sulfonamides or something like that. And it'd be great if we were able to disconnect that kind of design from reliable chemistry and simply design molecules on the, the basis of their, their function rather than how they're, they're prepared. In synthesis, there are very significant challenges, particularly if we're wanting to explore novel chemical space where we might need to autonomously design synthetic routes, so do retrosynthetic analysis. And then in order to execute those routes, that requires us to do multi-step synthesis um, at different stages. So maybe making um, building blocks on a relatively large scale to start with, before moving to the small scale synthesis of, of final compounds. 
in order to do that, it'd be great if we're able to predict um, which conditions to use or which catalyst would be best for a particular reaction. And we might need to optimize some of those reactions on the fly in order to make them um, viable. Um, Often, of course, it might be that a particular reaction is just not viable at all. And then I guess we'd need to be able to track back autonomously and find an alternative route through to our target products. For purification, it would be great to be able to do effective purification of molecules in parallel, or I guess to use assay technologies that um, um, are compatible with very minimal purification of, of target products. Finally, we need to automate the biology. So um, that requires us to automate many different assay types. And it'd be great to be able to do parallel um, assays, for example, in order to get a readout on many of the different data that are associated um, with our uh, particular discovery problem. Now, each of these challenges around the outside of the diagram are pretty significant on their own. Um, but of course, in order to realize fully autonomous molecular discovery, you would need to integrate all of these um, as well. So what I'm going to do before handing over to our, our speaker is just to tell you a little bit about an approach which we've been developing, um, which we call activity directed synthesis, which we think um, has got um, potential to become a fully autonomous uh, molecular um, discovery um, approach. So it borrows some concepts from the evolution of biosynthetic pathways, where, of course, we've got metabolites, which are substrates for biosynthetic enzymes, which, together with cofactors, lead to the formation of, of natural products. Now, unlike human-driven molecular discovery, the emergence of these compounds is completely structure-blind and driven by the functional benefit to the host organism. And in the form of evolution, there's a mechanism to optimize the synthesis and the structure of the compounds in order to optimize that benefit um, to the host organism. And we asked the question, would it be possible to mimic this kind of approach in the laboratory, bearing in mind that around 50% or so of FDA approved drugs were inspired in some way by the structural diversity of natural products. So the workflow looks something like this. We do our reactions on a micro scale, varying the inputs, which are different substrates, co-substrates and catalysts. We let the reactions go to completion, scavenge them, evaporate them, and then test the crude products for biological function. And what we'd hope to see is that some of those reactions give rise to bioactive molecules, which can then inform the design of subsequent um, reaction arrays. And it's possible to go around this cycle as much as you like. Um, what you're actually doing is discovering the ways to make the bioactive compounds. At this stage, you don't actually know what their structures are. So what we typically do is to then scale up the most promising reactions, um, typically by a factor of 50 or so, um, purify the compounds, elucidate their structures for the first time, and then functionally um, characterize them. Now, I've not got time to go into to detail about the approach, um, other than to say that um, at no stage do we ever design a bioactive molecule. Instead, we design reactions, which are then prioritized on the basis of the function of the products that they produce. So in this case here, we use the approach to do a activity directed fragment growth. So we started with these substrates, which were related to some fragments um, for um, the, the androgen receptor and re we reacted these compounds with diverse substrates that can do many different things. So for example, NH, OH, CH insertion, cyclopropanation, ILID formation, um, and so on. In the first round, the active compounds were um, shown here. So by reaction with indole or cyclohexene. On the basis of that, we then used similar co-substrates in the next round that were related to these two co-substrates shown in, in blue. That enabled us to find that heteroatom substitution was good, as well as um, benzo fusion. And then in the third round, we again varied the co-substrates, um, jumping to co-substrates such as these. So you can see perhaps why we chose this one, because it's structurally related to dihydropyran that was used in the previous round. In this case, we got some unexpected reaction outcomes. So an OH insertion to make this product um, bottom left. And 
reaction with the nitrile group here rather than cyclopropanation to give the corresponding um, oxindol. So overall, we did um, well over 300 reactions, but only ever purified seven products and in the process discovered four completely different molecular series using the same um, workflow. Um, we've reviewed our, our approach extensively, so different kinds of targets, um, both um, target-based and uh, phenotypic assays, different kind of assays used to support the workflow, as well as different chemistries. And we've used the approach to um, support a number of different medicinal chemistry um, strategies. And I guess this is relevant to today's webinar because we believe that activity-directed synthesis has the potential to be fully autonomous um, because all of the stages within the workflow are fully integrated and performed in parallel. And we could imagine using algorithms to derive, um, sorry, to design those reaction arrays at each stage, completely removing the human-driven um, optimization or design, sorry, that is um, used in most current molecular discovery um, workflows. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the main speaker for our webinar today. Um, could I encourage people to put questions into the Q&A um, as we, we go along? Um, and then we can either answer them um, individually or um, at the end um, in the discussion. So our, our speaker today is Dr. Brent Kosher who is a postdoctoral researcher um, in Klaus Jensen's group um, at MIT in the Department of, of Chemical Engineering. And this team is, is, a, is um, a major interdisciplinary team, which is, both, which is integrating both digital and um, um, experimental technologies um, in order to address a very wide range of problems in the general area of autonomous chemical discovery. And really pertinent um, to today's discussion really is um, capabilities which are being um, developed focusing on the, the discovery of both functional materials um, and molecules. So without further ado, I'm going to, to hand over to, to, to Brent. Thank you for the introduction. Um, is my screen sharing okay? Perfect, Brent. Um, like I had mentioned, I'm a postdoc in Klaus Jensen's lab, and we've kind of been interested in this um, intersection of both property predictions, reaction predictions, process chemistry conditions, and also, you know, conducting the experiments for a while. So I kind of want to highlight some of the, uh, the tools that have been developed recently here at MIT that sort of help address some of the, the challenges, the outstanding challenges that Adam highlighted in his introduction. Um, of course, the intersection of high throughput experimentation and machine learning is a very interesting one. Um, there's a variety of high throughput experimentation platforms that exist in both batch and flow chemistry, which are nice, fast, automated, and consistent, but experimental design, like was mentioned, is somewhat challenging. On the other hand, a lot of these machine learning based techniques have a variety of different reaction chemistries that they can predict. And the property design space that they can try to explore is vast. However, the experimental verification is somewhat slow. So one of the questions that we wanted to address, especially as I started my postdoc, was could we get the, both, the best of both worlds all in one discovery process? And like was mentioned, we want to focus on these property-driven design spaces. And this gives us something to explore, and it gives us some target applications in mind. Of course, we have pharmaceuticals, which it seems to be the, the interest to talk today, but there's also property spaces in a number of different application areas, from organic electronics to reaction discovery, identifying new substrates that may be interesting, to something like energetic materials, which my uh, grant sponsor is quite interested in. Now, given the applications of interest, we can sit down and define a key set of properties that we can optimize over. And this gives us a handle to explore in those spaces. The introduction slide kind of gave a great overview of what this process might look like and some of the challenges go along the way. Several research groups across MIT have been working on kind of individual pieces of this pipeline. 
And at this point, many of those pieces exist. So the question we want to ask is how can we stitch them all together and get data to move through the cycle by itself? I want to briefly touch on some of the enabling components as they go through. Um, and many of these tools can be treated as flexible modules where you can plug and play different models, different approaches to generating new molecules. And this could allow us to do reaction discovery, process optimization, or molecular discovery all on the same platform, just depending on what our driving model is. So if we kind of dive into how the process might work, it all is going to start with some sort of dream, some sort of property space that we're interested in, some sort of performance that we want. From the introduction slides, we may be looking for something like biological activity. And that may be confirmed from the site highlighted where they were doing a nice amount of diversification. So maybe that becomes your design space, you know, conserving some part of the molecule while varying something else. Um, for this talk, we're gonna start with a non-biological system. Um, logistically, it's a little bit easier to measure a physical system that uses the electronics uh, of the molecule. Um, but we think the same workflow translates to biological systems as long as you have the guiding models to make predictions for biological activity. And that's an area that we're interested in moving into kind of as the workflow is developed. So our kind of discovery task that we're going to walk through during today's presentation is a, a pretty simple one. We're just going to be looking at dyes, and then we're going to be proposing new dye molecules that increases the maximum absorption wavelength, which could be very interesting for bioimaging probes, while maintaining water solubility, while maintaining a good partition coefficient. Now, to just kind of give a, a quick primer on how we can approach molecules, um, there's a number of ways to describe molecules systematically. There's, of course, we can go through our standard naming conventions, whether that's some trade name that has been given to it or IUPAC names, they all derive from something. Other ways we can think about doing it is on SMILES, INCHI, or INCHI key. These are all algorithmic ways to encode molecular information into a string. This captures the structure in a systematic way, but it often is not the most useful for machine learning beyond simple classifications. The way that we're going to be approaching a lot of these problems is we're going to be encoding the molecules into a molecular graph. This approaches each atom or a molecular fingerprint, depending on how you want to encode the molecule, and encodes the full structure into a bit vector. And now that we have this bit vector, it's a much more flexible representation that we can use to drive all of our machine learning models that we're going to talk about in a little bit. And I think the, the big takeaway that I, I would like to kind of bring up about using molecular graphs is that we think that this is a representation that is able to capture more information and more detail systematically. Now, once we have sort of our molecular design in this, our design space, in this case would just be making water soluble red dyes, we can then move on to generating candidate molecules. And this is one of the, the challenge areas that we're brought up in the introductory slides. Um, we can oftentimes think about the pieces of the molecule contributing their own functionality. So if we had enough molecular graphs to choose from, we could try to make new molecules based on what we've learned from the other molecules. And hopefully these new molecules would have our properties of interest. So some of our computer science collaborators have been working on a generative model workflow that converts one molecular graph to more molecular graphs by picking and choosing pieces of the molecule. So in this workflow, you could take in your initial data set that contains all of your molecules that you measured before. You can split them into two different clusters. And within each cluster, you can group them based on molecules that have worse performance and molecules that have better performance for your property of interest. You pair them up. Then you run a molecular graph to graph translator, which generates a new molecular graph which we then can evaluate against our property space. And by doing this over and over and over again, we can systematically nudge poor performing molecules towards better performing molecules by sort of learning what is important to the molecule. This workflow was used to improve the solubility of drug-like molecules. Solubility is one of those problems at the industrial scale that's 
you know, super critical when you actually start doing processing or actually start thinking about formulations. This approach quickly proposed hundreds of thousands of new potential structures. Some of them had interesting um, substructure um, that were proposed. And then when we evaluate it with a solubility um, predicting model, the candidates had a huge range of solubilities while maintaining some semblance of the original molecule. Now, for our purposes, maybe an example pairing that we might use to think about how we can make water soluble dyes is we could take something like anthracene, which is not going to be very water soluble, but maybe it has the dye like properties that we're interested in, and we could pair it with a Laura red, which would be highly soluble, you know, that's food, red food dye 40. And then our graphs that come out could be a combination of these two molecules. Perhaps it's just anthocene with a couple of sulfonates on it. But what we've done is we've generated new molecules that we think will have better properties. Now, that is one approach to generation, and that, that is a set of tools that have been developed. An alternative approach, so I'm going to give you two proposals of how we can generate molecules and then kind of compare them in a second. More often, from more of a hit to lead workflow, we might have a couple of candidate structures that we want to diversify. When we start thinking about how we decode graphs, it's pretty challenging to actually build target molecules. And the crux of the issue comes when you try to decode molecules, it's often done atom by atom which is somewhat challenging to get things to close, especially like ring structures, mostly because that molecule isn't valid. In this particular example, the molecule's not valid until that thiophene ring closes. So an alternative approach that our computer science collaborators came up with is instead of embedding it on a atom by atom basis, we can embed it on a motif by motif basis. So we can embed complex structures in as a single node, that way, when we encode and decode, we can go through um, these motifs that then get decoded all at once. This prevents a huge computational overhead and a lot of failed uh, reconstructions. And they, they name this a hierarchical graph encoder. Then once you have your, your encoder in place, so now you can encode your molecules into a bit vector, you can then run your decoder, which will then give you back your complex structures with the attachment sites that it's learned exist. So in this approach, hierarchical graph completion will do a great job at conserving some critical substructure. And if we think about the introductory example that Adam gave, there was a conserved structure there that we maybe want to diversify along. So an implementation of this workflow is also quite straightforward. First, we would take our hierarchical graph encoder and we would train it on just general chemistry. So we would take all of the molecules that occur in Kimball. So those would be lots of molecules with different functionalizations, give it biological activity, give it optical properties, give it solubility. That way we can teach our model about general chemistry. And then we can fine tune that model on our specific data set of interest. For the purposes of this talk, we'll be using just a dye data set, um, just trained on some um, a representative set of commercial dyes. Then we can give the model a new thing to decode and it will start completing the graph. So if we gave it, for example, an anthroquinone and we told it to generate new candidate structures by just telling it any CH bond is functionalizable, we can get an absolutely enormous number of candidate structures that come out. So if we take those two kind of approaches to molecular design and we kind of compare the types of molecules that come out, in the graph-to-graph -graph translation model, we get a huge variety of structures and a lot of them are very creative. Um, some of them are synthetically challenging, but models believe that they have the properties that you may be interested in. On the graph completion model, you get, similarly, you get a large number of candidate structures the molecules tend to be a little bit less creative overall, but they're very focused. So for something where we want to diversify a scaffold, it would give us a huge variety of just common um, functionalizations that we may want to do automatically without really having to put much input into it, which then we can very, we can very easily think about this being a, a driving way to generate candidate structures for an autonomous pipeline. 
Um, for a lot of the things that we've been working on recently, we tend to favor the graph completion model to generate structures. Um, we've been really interested in kind of sticking towards like family level exploration, whereas the graph to graph translation model goes a little bit more broad chemical space. Now, once we have those, the molecules generated, we need to systematically evaluate all their properties and really predict what we think they may be. There are several competing methods present in the literature. Um, we end up using ChemProp, which was also developed by our computer science collaborators and some of our chemical engineering collaborators as the basis for our property predictors. The underlying model is a message passing neural network. It uses pretty simple input data, which is a, tra a training list of molecules with the representative data point, just either a scalar or a list of values. The molecules then get encoded into a latent space representation that we can then pass new generated molecules into to get a predicted value. And if we kind of compare its performance across a variety of different um, relevant data sets, things like the solubility data set, like the felicity data sets, protein binding, toxicity data sets, it gets very good agreement, but it's a model that's very simple to use. So it uses very simple overhead, it doesn't require a machine learning expert to implement, but you can get very good results. And this is something that we can um, very quickly train. We can also trigger it to be trained automatically as new data comes in. Another important feature of ChemProp, especially when we start thinking about how we might use it to guide exploration, we need to know when models are confident in their predictions. When can we trust them? When can we not? And also when are additional data points needed? Because the ChemProp models that we use are lightweight to train, we can train an ensemble of them, each from slightly different train test splits and initial conditions. Then we can ask how the predictions vary across that ensemble of models as a gauge of how well the space is explained and kind of give us an idea of where to explore. ChemProp has ensemble variants built in as well as more complicated uncertainty metrics. But the real main takeaway is the ChemProp gives us a pretty light way, lightweight way to predict properties and also give us a gauge for how confident we should be in those predictions. So for our example design space, we would be looking for UV vis and molecules with low log p values. Mostly we want things that are gonna be good bioprobes, but also partition well into aqueous solutions. And these are two you know, general properties of interest for a number of different applications. The UV vis absorption maximum model is trained on experimental data sets that have been augmented with DFT calculations to help the model generalize to a larger chemical space. And the log P model predicts solvation free energies in different solvents that we can then use to calculate the partition coefficient at a octanol water interface. Other ChemProp models exist in literature. You know, they're very easy to plug and play. These two are the ones that will be presented in this presentation. And you can find links to these on, on the web so you can play around with them. With uh, kind of generated molecules from our um, graph completion model and uh, a nice ChemProp model kind of underlying the predictions, we can then start making um, property predictions on all of those candidate molecules. And then we can plot a space that they cover. And then we end up seeing that the predicted molecules cover a pretty good region of UV vis log P space. And if you're interested in other models, as long as you have a model that can make these predictions, you can get an idea of what space that it can cover. If we think about biological probe-like molecules, maybe the regions of interest that we may be targeting would be longer absorption wavelength predictions while keeping the partition coefficient low. And because we kind of know what spaces that we want to go to, we can write functions that, that rank the different regions of this property space more heavily than the others, which gives us a way to rank predictions from perhaps very interesting, according to model predictions, all the way down to things that we don't want to bother making because they're just not in our target design space. And then we could pick the highest value molecules. 
And because ChemProp gives us both the, a target property value and also a ensemble variance, how confident the model is, we could have a switch that we could turn to go from exploration, where we're simply making molecules to make the underlying model understand the chemical space better, all the way to doing exploitation, where we're really taking what the model thinks it's very confident in and trying to get property-driven molecules to fall out of it. Once we kind of have the molecule space kind of selected, we have an idea of some of the properties, we have an idea of some of the ones that may be interested, we can start planning how we might reach those high value molecules. There are a handful of computer-aided synthesis planning packages available out there. At MIT, our lab and others have been working on ASCOS, which is being um, built as a general organic chemistry reaction prediction suite of software. One of the most important tools is the retrosynthetic predictions. And what this is going to do is going to take our target molecule that was spit out by our generative model and do a retrosynthetic analysis by itself to track it back to commercial precursors. So if we have a very simple example down at the bottom, like this nitrophenanthrene, the question that we would ask is, what chemicals do we need to have on hand to make this molecule? So the back end of the ASCOS retrosynthetic planner are retrosynthetic templates, where in advance, we take all of the literature data that we have access to, and we break it down into its representative reactions. So a relevant literature example might be nitric acid plus benzene goes to nitrobenzene. And if we extract a template for it, a template being a retrosynthetic transformation that explains the reaction that's taking place, we can find a template for that transformation, which we can then apply to our target molecule, which would back it up to two commercially available reagents that would lead to our target. Now, while this is a relatively simple example, there are templates that represent millions of recorded literature reactions over hundreds of reaction classes. ASCOS recursively applies these templates, working towards simpler precursors in a tree searching algorithm. This recursion terminates at commercially purchasable in-stock reagents. The results are reaction networks that connect our molecule to reagents, which is very important when we actually get down to planning the which reactions we want to do. All of this is set up to run automatically with pretty simple API calls. So for our little design space here for close to 20,000 or so generated molecules, uh, we built trees for all of them in about 12 hours. For our anthroconone example, um, our derivative would require more reactions than some of the, the very simple um, highlights. Um, the final product that we were that we generated is the one that's highlighted in yellow. And this can be accessed using three commercially available reagents that are available for you know, a couple dollars per gram and two reactions, a Friedel Crafts type um, acylation cyclization reaction to build an intermediate product that then we can use a heck reaction to kind of finish building our target product. Once we you know, generated the reaction pathways for all of our molecules, we can then group all of those automatically But before that, I just want to give a highlight for some of the other modules in ASCOS. I forgot this slide was here, sorry. Um, the Reaction Tree Builder is not the only um, functional module in ASCOS. There are a number of other tools that are API callable. There is a reaction condition recommender that predicts reagents, solvents, catalysts, and temperature to conduct reactions from the reaction tree. There's also a reaction impurity, a forward synthesis, regio selectivity and site selectivity model. And these can give additional insight into the reaction pathways that are predicted by ASCOS and give us a better idea of whether the predictions that ASCOS is returning are likely to be major product, high yielding pathways, or if it's gonna be more of a complex reaction mixture, which can give us some additional insight to maybe which trees we should favor over others. And we can do this all automatically. 
with all the targets and reagents predicted, we then can rank the molecules, not only by the properties that we predicted with our ChemProp models, but also by their predicted reaction tree as well. The products that we want to make use common reagents that are affordable. And the prediction reaction, the predicted reaction conditions are executable given the methods and tools that we have at our disposal, which we can kind of narrow down the reaction space depending on what we have. And then we can think about the products that we want to make, whether they're unique products and diverse, that way we can explore more chemical space faster. And by framing the reaction trees in this light, we can select divergent syntheses that we can actually do. So the combination of a practical consideration, how much do things cost, what type of reaction trees can we do, and model considerations like their property values, let us rank products that we actually want to make, and then we can actually get down to making the top performing molecules. To sort of show that these tools actually work all together in an integrated fashion, of course, we need a automated discovery platform. So we've been building an interconnected synthesis and characterization platform. The platform is a well plate based synthesis platform where we've been using a TCAN liquid handler and a couple of just normal heaters to conduct reactions between four and 240 degrees Celsius in air or inert atmosphere, which does restrict the reactions that we can do, but it's still broad enough to explore lots of chemical space. And because we're on this well plate format, we can conduct many reactions in parallel. There are two robotic arms that move the well plates between the various platform modules. And there's an underlying control network that we've been developing that converts the predictions made by um, ASCOS and all of the property prediction pipelines into a series of platform operations by itself. Just taking into account what chemistry it needs to do, it can identify what types of workflows that it should be working with. Oops. Once the reactions are conducted on the platform, uh, the platform then has some modules available to allow it to do some intermediate purification. We have your classic liquid-liquid extraction, and we also have filtration. Here we need to remove those solids before we can take it off to HPLC uh, for analysis and purification. By running semi-preparative HPLC with UV viz and ESI mass spec detection, we can automatically detect and isolate our target molecules from a reaction suit. Uh, then pure materials are available to the platform for characterization. One of the additional uh, challenges that Adam brought up was the ability to sort of assay and characterize everything you need to on the platform as you make molecules. Um, to drive the characterizations, we've been um, using automated wall plate based spectral measurements, which are cheap and fast. They're also pretty general. So of course, for our example demonstration here, it gives us idea of dialect properties, but a number of very interesting assays are also built around normal spectral measurements where there will be a bioprobe bioassay or a chemiluminescent assay, like something like a luciferase assay. So it gives you some access to some more general assays. Two relatively simple assays that we can build off of some very base spectral measurements are partition coefficient measurements and photostability. Uh, for log P, all we need to do is measure a partitioning across an optimal water interface, which can be quickly measured by taking two absorption spectra of well plates prepared by the liquid handler. And then for photostability, we added a solar generator that illuminates a well plate and periodically measures the absorption spectrum to track the decrease in signal as the sample degrades. By doing that at, a different, at a different temperatures, we can measure the photolytic activation energy. And then you could imagine as you build up this initial data set, you could use that as a guiding molecular property to select photostable molecules in addition to things that have good performing optical properties and good performing solubility. And this could all be done also in a ChemProp model, as long as we could define our property of interest numerically. 
Now, of course, we've been running this platform, the full integration of this, um, and the data shown here are from um, some experiments that we've been doing. This is the combination of synthesizing and characterizing new molecules that we can then use to retrain the initial molecular prediction um, models. The data shown here are for some different scaffold molecules that we've been working on, which we won't really get into the details of because we're still you know, working on that story. But I, I wanted to kind of give you the important takeaway from what we've been seeing. And that's the pipeline's able to propose new molecules, it's able to propose reasonable reactions, it's able to execute those reactions and characterize the products of those reactions by itself. Then it feeds that information back into the original property predicting models. And after retraining, we see a good improvement of the predictions in that space. So after retraining and validating with test train splits for a moderate size data set, we get a sizable improvement in the model predictions. And we're getting shifts of the average uncertainty in these kinds of property spaces for something like UVVIS from around 15 to 20 nanometers down to somewhere closer to five nanometers, which means we're getting much, much better at making those predictions. So if we tie all these tools together, we can really see how we have a lot of the pieces in place to sort of drive this autonomous discovery as long as we can kind of define what we're interested in. So with that, I just want to loop back to the cycle that we presented a little bit earlier in the presentation. And I want to kind of reiterate this point that I think that a lot of the individual pieces we sort of need to drive the autonomous discovery are in a functional form. And one of the big challenges and one of the challenges that we've been working on recently is how do we connect all of these individual pieces that exist in a functional form into a functional workflow that can really drive autonomous chemical discovery? And we're hoping that we can continue making advances towards that. And we're hoping that we'll have a couple of stories come out relatively soon. So be on the lookout for that if you're interested. And if you're interested in checking out some of the tools, um, there are a lot of people who are working on the pieces that we are connecting to really make autonomous closed loop discovery possible, especially make it possible here at MIT. Um, for the project that I'm working on, which is really focused on the integration of it, there is an absolute ton of people working on it from computer science to DFT theory predictions to the experimentalists that were, you know, which are BS trying to actually kind of run those experiments. There are also a huge support team behind ASCOS and ChemCrop, two very useful general chemistry packages. There's a very active development community there. And their hope is to have it as general organic chemistry tools that require relatively low overhead to really get started in. And I wanna thank you all for your attention. And I'm hoping that uh, I may have convinced you that some of the tools that we need to drive this autonomous discovery do exist in a functional form. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Brent, for the um, for the fantastic um, lecture. Um, it would be great if people could put some questions into the uh, the Q and A so that we can, um, you know. Uh, answer questions so um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have as as well as of course um, questions directed towards um, Brent. Um, perhaps I might start Brent so we've obviously the audience here is very much interested in the discovery of um, high quality chemical tools so um, small molecules that um, modulate a particular target within the context of a cell um, mm -hmm. selectively. And I can see that many of the components that you've talked about could be applied to that problem. And I, I wondered if you could perhaps give us a feel for, you know, what kind of time scale and um, developments are needed in order to enable autonomous discovery of, of functional small molecules. So I guess to start with, it might just be worth considering, you know, how perhaps to optimize the structure activity relationships around a, a specific scaffold um, as, a, as a relatively straightforward problem, I guess. So I think there's a, you know, a variety of different uh, challenges that arise when we start thinking about bioactivity. So that's also a, an area that we've been kind of interested in thinking about a little bit. Um, one of the 
challenges in sort of the bio space is that a lot of the assays are somewhat, you know, it's expensive to get the data for it. And if we kind of look around the literature, everyone has their own way of running a bioassay. So I think the timeline in getting that up and running is really focused around developing the model, the underlying predicting tool, you know, feeding that data into Kimprop in a way that you get a nice consistent data set to make those predictions. And I, you know, that's one of the challenges that come up over and over again when we start thinking about biological activity. It's such a nuanced thing and we need a big data set to do it. So it really helps when you have this um, scaffold in mind that you want to screen around because then you can build your data set up as you're exploring. But for, in order to do it in more general chemical space, we need to think about how do we get a general data set that's able to kind of describe multiple different facets of biological activity. Yes, I mean, you're, you're certainly right that the, the problem is more straightforward if you're focusing around a specific chemical scaffold. But even that is, I think, pretty much unsolved problem if you're you know, predicting molecules that have never been made, um, identifying methods to make them, um, making those compounds and um, experimentally measuring um, their properties. Of course, it's a whole different question entirely if you um, are just wanting to look for any scaffold or compounds based on any scaffold that might inhibit um, a particular um, target. Absolutely. And that's one of those areas where when you want to start that discovery, because the model needs to be developed as you go, you know, you're going to have to be willing to accept some degree of risk. You know, not every molecule that you're going to make is going to be a winner because you've got to, you've got to teach the model generally where to, to explore. And you need some bad examples as well as good ones in order to train the model, of course. Absolutely. And the bad ones tend to be more valuable than good ones. Yeah, can I can I ask a follow up question on that, particularly that point? How um, for a given scaffold, let's say, um, how many? Uh, and you're you're trying to um, develop it into, um, you know, a bioactive molecule that will modulate, you know, a given protein target, for example. Roughly, um, I'm not familiar with the numbers. So how many? new molecules would you need to make um, and, and roughly what sort of, um, so you know that first molecule interacts with your, your target somehow, right? Probably weekly. Um, and how many new molecules would you need to make and what percentage of them would have to have some activity uh, on the target for you to then, for your model to learn enough that it could go back and make a better set of compounds? Any so sense? that is a that is an incredibly difficult question to, okay. to answer, right? It's a, it's a very nuanced answer as well. Yeah. Um, but even ballpark, are we talking so, I mean, tens or hundreds or thousands of compounds? Well, the more focused your search is and the more well-defined your structure function relationship is, you need less molecules. You may be able to get away with 50 to 100, for example. For things where the structure activity relationships are much more nuanced, you may need a very large data set. Other things you can do to kind of help your model along is to begin with a pre-training where you train it with something that's related to your property of interest. That way it can get an idea about things that may be related to your, your property. And then you can feed in data sets later that allows it to fine tune more specifically on your property of interest. So there are some tricks that you can do in the machine learning space to sort of minimize the number of experiments that you need to do. Mm -hmm. But in terms of identifying how many you need to do in advance, that's a very difficult question to answer. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking scale. What sort of scale would we, you know, someone from the protein side like me would would we need to assay, right? So there's a, um, there's a very interesting case, well, there's a number of interesting case studies that were published by a company called Cyclofluidic. So mm -hmm. it's based in the UK and it was really specialized in, well, in a closed loop molecular discovery platform, if you like. So they were actually doing their chemistry in flow, which meant that they make one compound at a time. And um, they were searching relatively small um, 
um, molecular spaces. So typically um, a single scaffold and varying the substitution um, around it. Um, but in some of the, the case studies that they published, they um, refined the model at each stage as they got new experimental data and were able to optimize those structure activity relationships within tens of cycles, so less than 100 molecules. Um, now, that is, I guess, a relatively easy problem in the sense that it's all based around one chemistry, it's all based around a specific scaffold, but perhaps that gives you a feel for um, the scale of the problem. And of course, by building a good model, you're able to sort of minimize the number of experiments that are needed to find the optimal mo molecule within a particular space. Um, Brent, we've got a question in the, the Q&A, which perhaps I could put to you. So uh, Ra Raja, I think it is, has asked whether um, your approach can be used for antiviral drug discovery and specifically involving peptide-based gold nanoparticles. So um, I, I'd wondered if you've got any comments ab about that. Hmm. So, you know, having those uh, gold nanoparticles present, you know, makes it a more of a complicated system than just pure, pure molecules. And what I'm not sure from the question is, for example, how the peptides are functionalized on the nanoparticles. So it might be. Right. And is this a, you know, designing a, like a designer peptide where your prediction task is, you know, very specifically tailored towards like peptide substrate activity type things? So I don't know. It'd be useful if. Raja perhaps could put in a bit more detail into the question. I think, I think the general answer to that could, is likely going to be along the areas of, if as long as you can make a model that can make those types of predictions that are relevant for antiviral drugs, you should be able to do it. Because you're going to be working with a much larger molecule, much larger substrate, all these peptides are going to be, you may need additional examples. So in the small molecule space where we can, you know, get away with defining structure function relationships with just a, you know, a handful of heavy atoms, the more and more atoms that we add into it, we'll need a little bit more examples to really teach the underlying models what matters and what doesn't. But of course, with the peptide, there's much less heterogeneity around, you know, linkages. So obviously, it's only amide linkages and you know sequence of um, building blocks. Um, Absolutely, that's relevant. So in 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 one sense, it's actually a simpler problem than small molecule space, perhaps. So, unless there's any more questions, I suggest we call it to a close at that point. Um, Cheryl, have you got anything else to, to add before we finish? Well, I'd like to thank you both for really informative uh, and exciting presentations. I think the future is, um, yeah, they're going to be very interesting. So quite a challenge, quite a challenge. But I think, you know, starting off with small small uh, tractable projects that this field will really grow in the, you know, uh, in the biological application space, which we're interested in. So I look forward to seeing how things progress. And um, thank you for, um, thank you for, is there another question? Oh, no, okay. Yeah, so thank I mean, you for your presentations. And I, mean, um, I, I would definitely like to, to very much thank, thank Brent for telling us about all of the exciting, very multidisciplinary work um, going on at MIT. I think everyone will have got a feel for what a multifaceted problem this is. You know, it's not a right. simple case of just solving the problem of retrosynthetic analysis or optimizing a reaction. Actually, it's many, many different technologies that need to be pulled together in order to, to, crack, to crack this one. But certainly a hugely exciting area to work in and um, huge potential to, to impact on drug discovery and chemical biology. So thanks very much for, for your time, Brent. Thank you. And our next um, 
webinar in September, September 20th is going to be on the focus of um, deubiquitinases and um, use ubiquitin specific proteases and how to harness and, and inhibit them and turn them into uh, degraders, I believe. So um, thank you once again. <laughs>